Hello, and welcome back to Overland Italy. I'm Jay Butler, your host. Today is Sunday, November the 19th, 2023. And today, I've got a question for you. Do you believe that this is the best Land Rover Discovery 3 or 4 overlanding vehicle in the world? Our journey began at the foothill of Mount Etna in beautiful Sicily, Italy in December of 2019. I found this Zermatt Silver Discovery 3 TDV6 HSE Land Rover in Rome and brought it back home. It had a beautiful black ebony leather interior, which I found to be very easy on the eyes as well as a Harman Kardon surround system stereo, which is excellent even to this day. One of the first things that I installed in the car was this Ritchie compass and a dash mat to cover some of the cracks in the dash that are pretty typical for this vehicle and its age. I was very fortunate to find a vehicle with low miles. This one only had uh, just over 91,000 kilometers at the time of purchase, which is just over 56,000 miles, which I think is exceptional for a 14-year-old car at the time. The center console was a little busy, but functional. Land Rover is world renowned for its terrain response system and also has an outstanding hill descent control feature as well. The center knob is to change from normal drive into grass, gravel, and snow, followed by mud and ruts at the top. And as you continue around the dial, your next setting is sand, followed by rock crawl for your most extreme off-roading. The knob on the left is for your air suspension to raise and lower the vehicle, assuming you still have air suspension in the car. And the other knob is to take the vehicle out of its permanent high four-wheel drive setting and reduce the gearing to low four-wheel drive. The seating is very comfortable, particularly over bumpy roads, and there's plenty of legroom. The stadium seating in the rear of the vehicle is quite famous for the Discovery and gives an outstanding panoramic view for the rear passengers. The seats are far more comfortable than they look, but perhaps not the best for extended trips. The Discovery 3 and 4 are known for the large volume of space that they have in the trunk or rear of the vehicle. Once you remove this privacy screen, the space really opens up and gives you tremendous opportunities, uh, particularly with this split drop-down tailgate. There's also two seats there, which I use very infrequently, that pop up uh, to seat seven people in the vehicle if you wanted. The roof lining was sagging, but I just took it to a local person and had the entire thing replaced for about 200 bucks. I purchased a full-size Land Rover dog cage. I wasn't really sure how to divide the space at the time, but I was concerned of objects flying forward in the event of an accident or even potentially a rollover. I also picked up this rear shelf, uh, which was quite handy, exceedingly well-made, albeit quite heavy. It was at this point that my overlanding passion began, and I started by installing a 67 liter water tank from Frontrunner and a 1500 watt inverter from NDS. I installed this stainless steel powder coated two drawer system from Frontrunner in an effort to organize my stuff. This is my wife's pug, Charlie, which I don't really consider to be a dog, but still cute as hell. My background and experience in the United States was really in four-wheeling and camping and hiking and canoeing and rafting, so the equipment I had in the vehicle really resembled off-roading more than overlanding at the time. 
but it did slowly progress into having equipment and materials that would enable me to stay on the road longer more than just emergency equipment in and of itself. My first build really made use of that backspace or trunk area to organize everything that I had using front runner boxes, chemical bathrooms, geyser hot water heaters. And like you, I was watching thousands of videos trying to figure out how to make the best use of my space because I still had room for passengers to sit in the rear of the vehicle. I could just drop one seat down and put my refrigerator freezer in the back, but if I wanted to, I could take it out and return the vehicle to a normal car. At the time, I was very new to overlanding and I wasn't ready to commit to pull those back seats out yet and make use of the entire rear portion of that vehicle because I was still learning how to make use of the space and install all of the wiring and the electrical, which I did myself. In the front, I was playing with toggle switches and front lights for the exterior. I also was concerned about security and so I installed a block system, which is a pretty phenomenal uh, concept in Europe where you install a second key in the steering column and it completely locks and blocks and will not allow someone to drive the car unless they have first in inserted that and turned it to remove that entire bolt uh, from the steering column. I began my second build by installing a glow-in-the-dark window smasher and seatbelt cutter and a Garmin 8-inch tread overlander satellite navigation system. So for my second build, I really wanted to rethink my initial design. And I began by removing the Ritchie boat compass because anytime a magnetic field was near it, it would interfere with the readings by as much as 20 degrees. There weren't too many options insofar as the installation was concerned and I wound up using the suction cup that came with the device. I was, however, able to hardwire the power into the ignition system so that it would turn on and off with the engine. It's a reasonably intuitive system with an intelligent SOS button that sends a signal to Garmin via satellite based on a paid annual subscription. At some point in time, I'll do a long-term review on this product, but overall, I would recommend it as a wise investment. Why? Because you need to ask yourself, could you escape from your vehicle in the event of an emergency? And if you could, who are you going to call? And exactly, how are you going to call them when your vehicle is flooded with water, the electrical system doesn't function, and if you could reach your cell phone, you don't have any service. So not to belabor the point, we've successfully used this product in Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and Albania with great success. Another very important device we use are Steely Balls. They're a very simple and effective way to mount cell phones, CBs, sat phones, and other devices onto your dash without having to drill into anything. The products at LandRoverPassion.com enabled us to install four toggle switches and two auxiliary buttons. We focused in on the ARB compressor, front and rear lockers, and spotlights for the top of the vehicle. On the left-hand side, we can see our main battery and auxiliary battery voltage. And on the right-hand side, we have access to two USB ports and can also see the volts produced there as well. The stock rear view mirror was pretty good, but I wanted increased visibility, particularly at nighttime with infrared. Because I had installed a rear tire carrier, I also wanted improved rear visibility when parallel parking in tiny little streets in Italy. This system allows for up to four different cameras to be viewed and has spectacular reflective properties when using it as a regular mirror. In an effort to protect our leather seats from the elements, I installed these Wetacoli seat covers for both the driver and the passenger. They're made out of a neoprene fabric, which is the same material used in wetsuits for scuba divers. Moving to the center of the vehicle, I placed fire extinguishers both on the driver and passenger side rear doors so that I could have access to it quickly from almost any location around the vehicle. 
the time finally arrived for me to commit and to remove the back seats. And in doing so, it enabled us to lay the foundation to create the best Land Rover Discovery 3 or 4 overlanding vehicle in the world. This serious build-out began with a customized 186-liter stainless steel water tank. We were very fortunate that there's a large family-owned facility just down the street from us that specializes in customized stainless steel production. So we built out this six-sectioned water tank. Uh, the exterior is two millimeter steel inside baffles or 1.5 millimeters. And I have to give my hats off to Mino and his crew because the quality of the craftsmanship was just exceptional. I wound up removing this water pump and external filter because I changed systems shortly thereafter, although it was part of the original design. We placed the water input where the front of the water tank would be located. The attention to detail from my friend and cycling buddy Mino Didono was greatly appreciated. If you're going to place a water tank into your vehicle, you want it to be centrally located where it is as low, flat, and wide as possible to distribute the weight evenly around the vehicle. In addition to the internal baffling, we placed a thick rubber matting around the exterior of the water tank to deaden any sound from the water sloshing around the inside of the tank. Externally, the blue line ran to the water pump and our shower system. Whatever system you decide to install for yourself, it should be simple, easy to understand, use, and maintain. For example, when I got started, I used this manual switch to allow air to come into the tank as water was going out. I also used a low-tech but highly effective tube to visually inspect the water level. Another manual switch to ensure that water wouldn't start spraying inside the car in the event that the water pump was bumped and turned on. And finally, an external water line to gain access to the water in the event that your pump stopped working or you ran out of power. All you have to do is flip that little blue switch and water comes out by way of gravity. Last I checked, gravity isn't going to stop working or break when you need it most. After that rather arduous project was completed, we were able to lay in our platform upon which we could build out the rest of the interior of our vehicle. We went with a strong but lightweight wood and then covered it with a marine grade quality carpeting so that we could modify it and drill or screw into it as needed. I also removed the rear seats numbers six and seven, which were incredibly heavy so that we could put a slot where those seats used to be for the walls of our 270 degree awning. That way when the platform was completed, we could just grab the little handle and pull out the walls for our awning. As the interior of our vehicle began to take shape, I was able to relocate the NDS 1500 watt inverter, mount a five kilogram liquid propane gas tank, which fueled the hot water for our showers, and properly mount our Snowmaster 56 liter refrigerator freezer, which was connected to the solar panels for 24 hour power. I ran the large zero gauge battery cables along the side of our construction, not only for heat dissipation, but also for ease of access, maintenance, repair, or future changes to our build. Because I initially chose to mount the five kilogram fuel tank in the center of the vehicle on the floor, it wound up being a very difficult location to access the fuel tank to change it out. And I had to build a shelf around it to protect that fuel line as it came up out of the tank. I was also concerned of my choice of location for the inverter because if I waded through some serious water and it came into the vehicle, I could short out my entire system. So I basically turned the rear passenger door area into a closet where I would have easy access to chairs and bathrooms and towels, the sink for my kitchen and four wheel drive equipment. I made the top shelf an open area which would be easy to access. On the top shelf, I placed our lightweight clean waste toilet system, which is really easy to pull out. You flip it onto its back, open up the three legs 
And when you stand it up, it's got a nice protective covering where of course you're gonna be seated and you're able to sit down in privacy, take care of your business, drop in a couple scoops of the chemicals which uh, begin to break everything down, turn it into a gel, removes all of the smell and odor, tie the bag up and throw it into the trash bag where the rear tire is at the back of the vehicle. Before I was able to build our external shower system, which I'll get to in a subsequent video, I placed our hot water heater on this shelf with some towels in front of it so that when I wanted to take a shower, I could just pull it out and using a carabiner, clip it onto the exterior of the vehicle, run the black line, which was the gas uh, to heat the hot water, the blue line for the incoming cold, the red line for the outgoing hot water. And then by just using a magnetic adapter, I now had an external hot water sink. So it was a vast improvement over what I had in my first build. And when I wanted to break it down, I just put it into the little sink container, uh, put the top on it, which was to dry your dishes, and then place it back into my shelf on top of our four wheel drive equipment. If you've ever spent more than a few hours off road overlanding, you'll know how important it is to have proper seating. So I have a Yeti seat because I'm a pretty large guy and there's really only one location for me to place it and that is behind the passenger seat. So I was able to fold it up nicely and tuck it away into its home. There's a place for everything and everything has its place. Remember that when you're putting things into your vehicle. This was the first major build out that I had done on the vehicle making full time use of that back seat area. Everything was easily accessible and I certainly learned a lot during the process. Now that our internal platform was in place, I was able to move the refrigerator over to the driver's side of the vehicle where it had protection from sunlight because of our 270 degree XT awning. This Snowmaster 26 liter on the left hand side, 30 liter on the right hand side, refrigerator slash freezer combo has been an excellent value for the money. I removed the rear front runner drawers and then personally designed this custom back configuration where I could make use of the top space for pull out drawers from front runner, a proper kitchen, a place for my tools, and in the bottom, the walls for our 270 degree awning. This is what the space looked like before I put up the protective borders. This is what it looks like after. You simply have to have some method of protecting items from flying into the back of your head. On the left hand side, I had installed our ARB air compressor, which is required for the locking differentials front and rear that I have on the car. It also doubles as an easy way to be able to air up or and or air down uh, your vehicle when you're going off road, which is really very important for your traction. I was using the original front runner wolf pack boxes, much like I did with the pull out drawers with this open air configuration, but it really allowed a lot of dust to come in. And if I tried to place the old school lids on them, the clips were very difficult to open and close regularly. I admittedly have an open bias as I'm a huge fan of Primus stoves. I've literally been using them since I was a boy and I am 51 at the time of this video. They are insanely reliable, even at altitude, allow you to boil water quickly or lower the flame and saute without burning anything. I found this long narrow drawer to be quite favorable in holding all of my tools. It's very important to remember that as you're building your overland vehicle, everything you want to take with you has to go somewhere. Where are you going to put it? When are you going to gain access to use it? And how are you going to be able to put it back when you're in the field? This custom location we built into the base of the platform turned out to be very handy because we could easily, efficiently, and effectively pull out our entire walls for our 270 degree awning, access all of the equipment, and then return it when we were finished in a manner which made it enjoyable for us to use. 
This outdoor Mr. Buddy heater was a great asset to heat our 270 degree outdoor awning. I highly recommend using the Flame King multi-purpose refillable gas bottles. In my third and final build, I realized I had made several mistakes that I wanted to fix. First of all, I wanted to be able to separate the rear of the vehicle from the center of the car in case I ever wanted to put the seats back. Secondly, having a 50 gallon water tank was entirely overkill. So we chopped off the back end, left in the baffles, and reduced the overall size down to 30 gallons. In doing so, it now fit perfectly in that back seat section, reduced the overall weight, not only of the tank, but also of the extra 20 gallons of water, which is six pounds per gallon. We then put the flooring back in and relocated the mount for the liquid propane gas tank to a far more accessible location and repositioned the inverter higher up into the vehicle out of harm's way. I also wanted to be able to get my cross bike into the vehicle. So I installed the fork mount onto the flooring system so that I could secure the bicycle down and it wouldn't move while the vehicle was driving. I also had to be careful to position it so that the handlebars wouldn't hit the glass doors when you closed it. So I was sure to run a little test and place my hand behind the handlebars to ensure it didn't end in disaster. There was plenty of room on the other side for the door to close without issue, and you could still easily access the refrigerator. However, it didn't take very long for me to realize that it wasn't a very good idea to put a wet bicycle on top of carpeting, whether it be for boats or not. So I laid this heavy duty kind of plastic material that you'll often find in schools or gyms because it's just indestructible and carefully wrapped it around and on top of everything that I had done on the flooring um, in that center part of the vehicle. Turned out quite well and made things very easy to clean up if you've made a mess. All I have to do to be able to place the bike into the vehicle is to turn the refrigerator 90 degrees in this position so that the bike easily just goes into the car. But I'm not gonna take the bike with me on a trip longer than two or three days. So all I have to do is rotate the refrigerator back like this and I have that storage area space for longer excursions. And it returns the refrigerator to this position for easy access on long voyages. At this point, I had already spent several months living out of the vehicle and repositioning my equipment like this made it far more enjoyable on excursions lasting longer than 10 days. I had easier access to my CBs, recharging my uh, equipment, and even inflating and deflating my tires. I purchased new uh, front runner Wolfpack Pro boxes, which enabled me to keep the dust out of the food and equipment and gave me a little bit of privacy when I was in public areas. Even simple things like relocating your pots, pans, and dishes to the forward portion of a, of a drawer for easier access, and then putting your tools behind it, which you find yourself needing less frequently. Um, I also found myself not needing a two burner stove and moved over to a Primus one stove system. Uh, and that was really all that I needed and had my silverware easily accessible behind it. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that some of the ideas and experiences that we've had have benefited you. Please be sure to come back and join us again as we continue to share with you our build of this beautiful 2006 Land Rover Discovery 3 HSE TDV6. See you soon. God bless.